All right, so uh, chapter two, well, I guess two one is the power and radical functions. Okay, so basically what we're going to be doing is uh, looking at functions that are monomials, okay, and graphing them and describing their, their end behaviors and continuity and all that good stuff. Uh, so does anybody remember, first of all, what a monomial is? It's like, you know, it's, you know, I know what it is. I know you know. Isn't it, isn't it like x plus 6 and then a binomial is like x squared plus x plus 6? Nope. 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 I know what it is. <laughs> is there not anybody in here that's in word clues? Yeah. Mono means 1. Mono means 1. That's close. Mono and no. 1. Monomial, monomial. Remember that one word that we had one time that like overlapped? Oh yeah, that, yeah, that one time. It could happen again. One term. Okay, so a function that has one term is like 2x squared. There's no adding, there's no subtracting going on after. There's just one term. Okay, so it's going to be nice and easy. Uh, power, we're going to be dealing with stuff that potentially could have, um, let's see, we've got exponents. You guys know what a power is. Okay, and potentially exponents that have fractions in them as well. Okay, so what do those exponents do to our monomials? Okay, so we're going to go through the basics really quick. Uh, first monomial I can think of is x squared. What does x squared look like? I hope you know that. It is a parabola. It goes right through the origin, even though I missed it. Let's pretend I did hit it. Okay, the next monomial would be like uh, x cubed, right? What does an x cubed look like? John Travolta. John Travolta. Okay, so a right arm up, a left arm down. Um, I'm going to make a quick blanket statement and said, say anything that has an even power is going to look like a parabola. Okay, You might have some extra wiggling going in if you have more terms than one, but if it's a monomial, it will be a parabola. What's that? Exactly. Okay, The only way they can go down is if there's a negative in front, right? Okay, anything to an odd power... Looks like a John Travolta. Okay, um, let's make this a little bit more fun. Let's do a negative exponent. What happens if you have a negative exponent? What do you do with that term? You do. You put it into the denominator, and it looks like 1 over x. Okay, so anything... That is 1 over x or 5 over x. Doesn't matter what the number on top is. If there's an over x, it looks like this function here. Okay, it has a vertical asymptote where what is the one value that x cannot be? So there's a vertical asymptote at x, well, at x equals 0 because x cannot be equal to 0. It's an undefined value. Okay, it has a horizontal asymptote at y equals 0. You guys remember our cases, bigger on top, bigger on bottom, or the same. It would be bigger on the bottom. Okay, and now I'm going to make another blanket statement. Anything in the denominator that has an odd exponent will look just like this hourglass function. So if it was 1 over x to the third, it would look just like this. 1 over x to the 7th would look just like that. So the exponent has everything to do with how it looks. If it's an, if it's an odd exponent up there. At this time, we are having our earthquake drill. So every okay. So anything with an odd exponent that's in the denominator looks like the hourglass. Okay, so for the last example, 
Um, let's say you have x to the negative 2, what would that be rewritten as? 1 over, 1 over x squared. Okay, so now check out what happens on this one. This one on the, the right, it basically looks exactly the same as that um, the hourglass piece. But on the left, it stays above the x-axis. I think that looks like a volcano. Oh, so like a like both of them are going up. Both of them are going up. Okay, so anything with an even power here, um, they both will go up towards that vertical asymptote. So still, there is a vertical asymptote at x equals 0, and there's also a horizontal asymptote at y equals 0. The only difference is when it's even, they both stay above the horizontal or potentially both below the horizontal asymptote. Bless you. Pretty easy? Sure. Guess we'll find out, huh? All right, so this is what they're going to ask you to do. They're going to ask you to do a lot of things. They're going to say, describe the domain, the range, the intercepts, intercepts, the end behavior, the continuity, and increasing and decreasing intervals. We'll see. We'll see, we'll see. You guys have two days, so. That's, no, 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 it's been two days of gross. Nah. Alright, so let's do this while you guys are whining. We are using valuable time. Okay, what does this function look, look like if it's uh, one half x to the fourth? What does it look like? It is a wide parabola. That's very good, yeah. Okay, so a parallel because it's x to the fourth, right? And the one half just simply affects the slope. It's going to make it a little wider than normal. Wow, that looks like a V. Pretend that looks like a parabola. There we go. Thank you. Okay, so once we once we know what the function is, all of these things that they're asking us to do are really not that difficult. Yes, absolutely tedious, but yeah, not really hard. Okay, so let's talk about the domain. Um, the domain of any parabola is what? All reals. Okay, so you can write that from negative infinity to positive infinity um, as an interval, or you can write it as all reals, which is how I'm going to do it. Okay, what about the range? Think about from the bottom up. What is the lowest y value that you might have? Okay, so at zero, that's where it starts, and then it goes upwards. Okay, we include the value of zero, so we go from zero to infinity. You could also write that as y has to be greater than or equal to 0. That would work. Okay, intercepts. This is easy, too. Where does it cross the x-axis? Okay, let me write that differently. I'm just going to say x-intercept. Yeah, yeah. so x-intercept is at 0. The y-intercept is at 0. I mean, you can just look at that. It's going to be 0, 0. Okay, because there's no adding or subtracting, it can't move left or right, it can't move up or down, it's going to cross through the origin every time. The only time it doesn't is if you have one of the hourglass functions. I have a question. Yep. How come the domain is all real, but it can't be fixed? The domain or the range? The domain. The domain can be all reals because there's no value that I would plug into x that would get an undefined value. So there's no x in the denominator, and there's no square roots of any kind. Okay. Uh, for the end behavior, end behavior, what is my right and left ends doing? Going to infinity. So the right end and the left end are both going to infinity. 
Is that the X or the Y? You, you look at the Y when you're talking about in behavior. What is the Y value it's approaching? It's going up. Okay, is this function continuous? <laughs> yep, I can draw it without having to lift my, my pencil. It is continuous. Continuous function. Okay, and then from increasing and decreasing. So if I go from left to right, what is happening initially? Decreasing. Okay, remember when you're talking about increasing and decreasing, you use which values? A lot of people miss that on the test. A lot of people used, missed, well, yeah, I used the X, but a lot of people missed it and used Y values. Okay, so it goes from negative infinity to zero. So it decreases from negative infinity to zero and then increases from zero to infinity. Okay, so that's all the information. Was any of that hard? That's no. all I know. Um, can I do one more with one of the... Let's do one more with one of the... Um, I wanted to go blue. Let's do ooh, negative 3x to the negative 2. Okay. So if they give this to you initially, the first thing you want to do is rewrite it. If I have a negative exponent, what do I do with that x piece? Move it to the bottom. So my rewrite for this would be negative 3 over x squared. Okay, so what is this going to look like? First of all, if I have the x squared in the bottom, what does it look like? Okay, it's a volcano. If I have a negative what happens if you have a negative in front of any function? It flips it upside down. Okay, so this function is going to be the volcano, but it's going to be underneath the x-axis, and it's going to be going downward. Okay, so um, vertical asymptote is still where? Still at zero. Horizontal asymptote? Still at zero. Okay. All right, so let's talk about domain. Domain, what is the one value that x cannot be? Zero. zero. You can't divide by zero, right? So x cannot be zero. The range. Okay, think about going from bottom up. What's the lowest value that the y value can be? Negative infinity. What does it go up to and stop? To zero. Okay, it goes up to zero. Does it ever reach zero? No. No, okay, so we need a parenthesis with it. So negative infinity to zero. You could also say y is less than zero. Okay, where is my x-intercept? None, right? There is no x-intercept. Y-intercept? None. Those are both asymptotes. Okay, for my end behavior... Okay, and behavior, remember you're thinking about asymptotes, your horizontal asymptotes. We talked about this. Where is my end behavior going to? To zero in both directions. If it's bigger on the bottom, it goes to zero. So both right end and left end is going to go to zero. Is this function continuous? No, there is a break, right? So where is it not continuous? What x value? at zero, and what kind of discontinuity does it have? Non-removable. Okay, so we can say either it's non-removable discontinuity at zero, or we can even be more specific and say that there is a infinite discontinuity, saying that there's a vertical asymptote. Okay, so I'm going to say infinite discontinuity at x equals zero. Okay, my last piece is my increasing and decreasing. So going from left to right, what is happening initially? It's decreasing. It's decreasing from negative infinity to what? To zero. So negative infinity to zero. And then what happens on the other side of that? What is it doing? Increasing. So then it increases from zero to infinity. 
How do we do on that one? Not too bad? Okay. Uh, nope. I don't think so, no. No. Um, so I do I need to do any more examples of that? Good there? Um, okay, so the next thing is um, radical equations, or functions, I guess, excuse me, radical functions. Okay, so what you need to be able to do is to convert between an exponential form and a radical form. Okay, so um, let's say we have the cube root of x squared, something like that. Okay, so this is your radical form, right? Can anybody convert that into exponential form? Yes. X, x to the no, two-thirds. Two so it's x to the two-thirds. Okay, so the number on the top is always like the exponent, even that's been given initially. The number that's on the bottom is your your root. Okay, so since we had a cube root, it's going to go on the bottom. Okay, so this is exponential form. Okay, so um, all they're going to do with that is have you graph radicals. Okay, so for example, if you have x to the one-half power, um, that would be the same as what? The square root of x. Does anybody remember what the square root of x looks like graphically? No, it's a That's absolute value. An arm. Oh, so it's it's similar. Yeah, so it's like a parabola that got turned on its side, but only the top half of it. So I'm not saying your arm thing was wrong. Um, <laughs> okay. It was wrong. Uh, so is this an even or an odd function, by the way? Okay, so this is technically <coughs> even, so we're using the idea that the radical is an even root. Okay, so anything with a denominator that has a 2 or a 4 or a 6 is going to look like this uh, arm. <laughs> See, look, that is like Clearly, your arm is like that. See? It's my arm. Yeah. Starting at the, at the shoulder joint. Perfect. Yeah, Thank you. <laughs> Good anatomy lesson. Okay, what about if they ask you to grab graph the cube roots of x? What would that be the same as? Excellent. What exponential x form? To the x to the one third. Does anybody know what x to the one third looks like graphically? I sure do. <laughs> it's like a John Travolta. And it's flipped over on its side. So basically, if you think about x cubed, it's going to be that same exact function, but flipped on its side. Okay, so it turns into a John Travolta on its side. Okay, notice that it's hard to really say if its left arm is up or right arm since he's on the side there. Um, but that first arm is in the first quadrant, right? So notice that kind of a, there's a similarity between the two, right? They kind of both have that arm factor going on, but a Q root has a left, well, the other side. Okay, so they're going to ask you questions about that. Um, let's do an example of what you would see. Mm, I think I'm an example three, right? So they're going to basically ask you to kind of come up with those same things, find the domain, 
the range, the intercepts, the, all those same questions, but this time they're going to do it with radicals. Okay, so if they start with a nasty radical like that, the first thing I want to do is rewrite it. Okay, so what would the exponential form of this be? Mm -hmm. So notice that because the 5 is under there too, that it is to the 1 fourth technically, the x is the only one that has the, the cubic on it. Okay, so what is this going to look like? So I put everything that's underneath the radical in parentheses, and then since it was to the fourth power, fourth root. What? One fourth. Because all roots are to the one whatever root it is. It is the sideways parabola, okay? So this one is going to look basically going to have a steeper slope like so because of the 2, and technically the 5 would affect it as well. Um, but it's just going to be a sideways drawn, or excuse me, sideways parabola. Okay, so if we went through and did our quick uh, analysis of this, what would the domain be? If you go think about the x values, where, does the, where is the first x value that this function exists at? So it starts at 0. It technically does include the value of 0. And it goes to infinity. Okay, what about the range of this? If you start from the bottom and go up, what's the lowest y value? Also 0, and it does include that. Okay, what's my x-intercept? 0. y-intercept? 0. Um, what else do we have to talk about? End behavior. Ooh, end, end behavior. What's my end behavior? What's my right arm doing? The right arm is definitely going to infinity. What about the left? Okay, that would imply that it was going to zero. If I say the left end is going to zero. Okay, since the function doesn't exist at infinity, there is no left end. So we don't even talk about the left end. You only say that there's right end behavior. Okay? The function doesn't go to inf negative infinity. Is this function continuous? Okay, it is continuous. Why is it continuous? Because I can draw it without lifting my pencil. Okay. There's no jumps, no, there's no asymptotes. Because isn't it, if there's a square root or. <laughs> Right. Okay. Um, yeah, but because the function only exists to the right, there's no value that's less than it. So we could say, if you wanted to be really precise, you could say the function is only continuous between 0 and infinity. I got you. But since we already kind of defined that domain, we can say that it is still continuous on our domain. Um, what's the last? Increasing and decrease. So what does this function do? It increases only, right? Good. So increases from 0 to infinity. Okay. So that's uh, most of the assignment. Okay. The last part of this is uh, algebra and being able to solve radical equations. So this actually should be review for you. See if you guys remember how to do this. Um, let's say we have a cube root of 4x plus 8. And outside is plus 3, and that's equal to 7. Okay, so you're solving a radical equation. We got an equation, it's got a radical. How do I go about solving radical equations? Okay, very good. So I always want to first set it equal to the radical piece. So I would start by getting rid of the 3. So I have the cube root of 4x plus 8, and that's equal to 7. OK, 
Okay, now how do you get rid of a cube root? To the third power, because it is to the one third, so you go to the third power. So we're going to cube both sides. So that would give us um, 4x plus 8 is equal to, anybody know what 4 cubed is? 4 times 4, 64, good. Okay, so then just moving on from that, minus 8, so it's 64 minus 8. 64. 64. 64. 64. 16. 16 times 4. Yeah, no, wait, 16 times 2 is 34. No, 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 okay. So... 4 cubed is 4 times 4 times 4. 4 times 4 is 16. 16 times 4. Yeah, so you take 16 plus 16, which is 32, and then you multiply out 6. Good, so we agree. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> All right, so uh, 64 minus 8 is 56, right? And then if we divide that by 4, 56 divided by 4. 14, good. Okay, um, and I'm going to do one more example because I have one that's going to be like, oh, here comes the trick behind this. You know, there's always a trick sometimes. Well, not always. Let's see, this is going to be semi-gnarly, but it'll work out. Okay, so how would I do this one? <laughs> you can't? Uh, well, as long as there's an x under there, I can still solve it. There is an x, yep. 12x, yep. Yeah, so what should I do first? First I need to get rid, I need to set it equal to the square root piece. So what should I do first? Add the 2. So I'm going to add the 2 first. So I have 2x plus 2 on the left-hand side, and I have my square root on the right. So how do I get rid of the square root? So square it. Okay, now hopefully at this point when you say square it, I notice the, le the left-hand side is a quantity, and that means I have to square the quantity. So if I have a quantity that is squared, what do I need to do? I need to foil. Foil, foil, foil. Okay, so can I go about this foiling this the quick way, or do I need to actually foil it out? Can I do that the fast way? So to foil it, you do the first term squared. So if I have 2x times 2x, what would that give us? 4x squared. To get the middle term, you multiply the first times the last, and then by 2. So it's 2x times 2 and then 4x times 2, okay. so 8x, I did it the hard way. and then the last way, the last number is 2 squared, 4. You already are done? Good. Oh, that's fine. Um, so at this point I noticed that I have a quadratic. How do I solve a quadratic? You have to set it equal to 0. Okay, so at this point, I need to set it equal to 0 to solve my quadratic. So I have 4x squared. I'm going to add 12x, so what's 8x plus 12x? 20x's. And if I have 4 minus 100, 96 is equal to 0. Okay, so at this point, I have to factor this. There's an easy way to do this, and there's a hard way to do this. I could potentially use the hard method and factor this, or I could just divide everything, because what is every term divisible by? 4. I'm going to do that and make this easy. So I would have x squared plus 5x. What's 96 divided by 4? 24, good. Okay, now this is a little easier. I'm going to use easy method. What two numbers multiply to negative 24 and add to positive 5? Positive 8, and, whoa, that's not an 8. Positive 8, and negative 3. Okay, so what are the two solutions to this? 3 and negative 8. Okay, now what happens here 
is only one of these solutions actually is a, uh, a true solution to the original equation. Okay, so this is when you start to see extraneous solutions. Okay, so an extraneous sol solution is a value that you get by solving, but if you plug it back into the original function, it does not work. Okay, so you need to be really careful on scenarios where you have roots involved. Okay, so if we plug this back in, if I plug 3 in, um, I have 3 times 2 on the left-hand side, which makes what? 6. So I get 6 on the left. If I plug 3 into the, the middle, I have negative 12 times 3, which is? That one, yeah, that'll work with 8. So if you plug 3 in, you get 100 minus uh, 36. And 100 minus 36 is 64. The square root of 64 is 8. And 8 minus 2 is 6. So you end up getting 6 is equal to 6 when you plug 3 in. But when you plug negative 8 in, that's where you get the extraneous solution. Because if you plug negative 8 in on the top, you get 2 times negative 8, which makes negative 16. Okay, right away, that should be a problem for you. Okay, if I have a negative number equal to a square root piece, even if it's minus 2, that's not going to work. Right? Because a square root of any number turns to a positive. So negative 8 is an extraneous solution. Okay, so only three works. Okay, by the way, if you look at the first problem that I did versus the second one, what is the difference initially? There is an X on both sides. Okay, so heads up, flashing light. When you see an X on both sides with square roots, that's when extraneous solutions will occur. Okay, so that's when you need to specifically uh, check your answers. Okay, when the X's are on both sides. Okay? Alright, that's all I have for you guys. So, oh, there's homework. There's homework. You need a little rest. Oh. Let me take a look and I'll make it smaller than what I initially had. Because you're so traumatized. Okay, so there you go. That's not too bad. Okay, so the first set of numbers, 4 through 28, you're going by 4s. Flavia, does that make sense? Okay. Okay, and then 34 through 40 is evens. 